Oh, welcome to the 2021 API days. Um, my name is Chris, Chris Arvindon. I'm with the Deloitte platform engineering team. I'll be your MC today for this platform stream. Um, I'll introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Jason Esley. Um, Jason is a solutions consultant at New Relic. He's lived and worked in Australia for seven years, but now he's based in Singapore. Uh, with over 12 years of experience in enterprise software pre-sales and his entrepreneurial mindset, Jason is uniquely positioned to provide insight into how companies work and how people make decisions. And um, Jason is interested in software as a service and cloud-based solutions, as well as security fundamentals. Um, so I'll hand over to you, uh, Jason. And for the audience, while Jason is talking, if you have any questions, please just pop them in the chat. And then if we have time, we'll do a short QA session after Jason's talk. So. Yeah, um, please take it away, Jason. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Chris. That, that was a great introduction. Yeah, like, so the topic that I'm presenting today is it's called DevOps is Dead. And I know that might come as a shock to some of you, and especially a lot of you in the industry where you're trying to build up the DevOps culture within your organization. Uh, there are obviously organizations that started out as DevOps. Uh, organizations with the DevOps culture in place. And I just want to share with you what, why I think uh, DevOps is dead, uh, but it's not all bad, right? As you can see, I'm running a clean shirt, so there's some positivity coming up. Uh, but let me just start off and explain to you why, why it's dead, and then we'll get into the good stuff uh, later on today. We'll also have a Q&A session later, so if you've got any questions, uh, I'll be able to answer that uh, in the Q&A session in about five minutes uh, towards the end of the session. Okay. So yeah, uh, before I begin, I just want to say uh, a, a eulogy to DevOps, right? You know, dear DevOps, you brought two teams that never saw eye to eye together. You increased efficiency by up to 3,000 times. You helped change how software is made and delivered. You showed us the true meaning of collaboration. However, all good things had to come to an end. And you may be gone, but the spirit of your collaboration and efficiency lasts forever. You won't be forgotten. Yeah, so that's my eulogy uh, to, Dev, to DevOps. Uh, and let's talk about the life of DevOps, right? You know, how it started. It actually started um, when a guy named Patrick Dubois met Andrew Clay at a at a conference and they were actually the two only two guys attend watching the conference. So they naturally talked to each other at this empty room that back in the day in 2007. And they said we need something that's a bit more agile, right? You know, we can't keep fighting with uh the sys admin or the, the operations team to, to get things done. I know this this uh conundrum we're in um, it's not working. So they come up, came up with like the agile system administration group. Uh, they had a few ideas around agile, but the name really didn't uh, didn't stick. It was only until DevOps days, right? Uh, the conference that they organized together. Uh, they invited uh, companies like Share, Puppet, where the term DevOps actually started to take off, right? So. Who knows, like two of you here today you know, might be watching this conference and you might start to take off something on a whole different level. Like, you know, and, and it could be the future of uh, DevOps and especially with APIs now uh, becoming more prominent, right? Um, yeah, so that was the, the start of DevOps. And then as it started to mature, you, know, you had the Phoenix project that uh, Jing, Jing Kim came up with and then the Unicorn project as well. That really explained the whole DevOps uh, problem, right? That large enterprises started to, to take notice and say, hey, look, no, we also have the same problem. Like, how do we adopt these practices, right? And be like the, the companies that are releasing products really fast and like, uh, being agile and faster type of market. So, a lot of these practices started to be adopted, but with certain enterprises, they, they couldn't really fully adopt DevOps right? because there were a lot, a lot of conflicts in between. So you may have the DevOps, you may have even people with job titles called DevOps, but 
there was always the business or security or some other department that would like come in the way and say, hey, look, you can't do that. Like, oh, you got to have some uh, security first. And then, like, oh, you can't do that. There's no budget for it. There's always a lot of other departments, especially when you look at a, a large enterprise, right? A large organization. It's very difficult. Was very difficult to implement DevOps, and some customers uh, end up having two models. Two models, right? So you have a they cover a separate unit that operated on DevOps, and the rest of the organization uh, all operated in in one the same way. Like there was a term called bimodal uh, by Gartner. They talk about mode one and mode two. So there are these two modes that uh, they were trying to make it work, but it turned out that, yeah, it does work, but how do you get the rest of the organization to move fast as well? So that was a challenge uh, you saw. So yeah, why, why DevOps is there? Like, because as you start to see like the, the culture of people coming together is what DevOps was about, right? But in order for a lot of large organizations to, to really come together, it's not just about dev and ops. Like there's lots of other parts of the business and if it's just dev and ops, they started to have conflicts with other parts of the business and it became a lot of uh, long drawn out conversations and lots of like discussions to get small things done. And you often hear uh, terms like peace DevOps or DevSecOps, where DevOps try to incorporate another another part of the business like of the security team wants to have a say. One of the conflicts like you no know, DevOps have with security is DevOps mindset is Everything should be transparent and open, but security said, "Hey, no, 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 we can't let everyone uh, see everything. Like, you know, it has to be on an esplanade basis." So they say, "Okay, okay, let's work together. So let's come up with DevSecOps, right?" And then business wants that to get it because, like, hey, you can't do that. You know, the the budget and like the certain things are not aligned. We're not hitting our business targets and goals. Then you had biz DevOps, like you know, you had all this." different uh, permutations of uh, things like, like So I asked the question, like, what happens if every department wants to come together? Like, is it this, that, sec, ops, marketing, sales, HR, finance, and all, all of that together? Like, how, how does that actually work? So that's sort of the, the basis of my, my talk today. Like, what, what would actually happen, like, if you try to scale DevOps, like, across the organization, right? Uh, Sooner or later, you can't really everyone be like you know working in, in DevOps because you've got different departments that are quite different as well. And how do they uh, come together to work together? Yeah, so that was uh, a little challenge, right? Uh, with a lot of the DevOps. If you are a new startup and you just launch a product, yeah, sure, Dev and Ops, DevOps you know, works really well. Move fast, break fast, you know, and all that concepts. But if you move past breakfast in a large organization, I think you get a call call from a few different departments like, hey, hey, what, what are you doing? And customers are complaining, things are not working. So there comes to be some alignment uh, issue there with uh, DevOps, especially when it goes to larger enterprises. Yep. So, oh no, man, what do we do now? What do we do? Right? Um, so yeah, here, here, is a sneak peek, right? Of what uh, the future is about collaboration, and that's sort of the spirit of uh, DevOps. Right? The spirit of DevOps is there, although DevOps is sort of a uh, bit tight, but the spirit has risen. And like companies are realizing that collaboration uh, between like previously siloed teams like really unlocks hidden value, right? Um, even at New Relic, we are we're having the same uh, conversation, and we're having the same uh, collaboration uh, initiatives, like out now, right? Where we're collaborating with the marketing, right? So sometimes like marketing sends out information that like, okay, that's not really what the product does. And we have to tell customers that, right? So there's a mismatch between what marketing and, and uh, for me, I mean the pre-sales, right? So there's a mismatch in like, so we have to like explain to them. So getting all of these, right? Like getting everyone to speak the same language. And like, you know, if you look at Apple today, I think they just launched the, uh, iPhone 13, right? Apple is one of the few companies that has got that whole that whole ecosystem that funnel down really well, right? They've got their marketing that you know shows them uh, 
explain the value, but the whole experience from the store to purchasing the phone, uh, to support, and then the after sales, that whole uh, value chain across the, the different uh, journeys of the customer is all, is all uh, quite consistent, you would say. Like you know what you're going to get, at least with, from the experience point of view with an Apple product. Uh, so very few companies have it down like, like the way Apple has done because uh, different business units are, are incentivized differently and they have like different goals, right? So the only way to get them together is through collaboration. And that's where a lot of companies are headed towards, right? To, to unlock the hidden value. Uh, yeah, so we're moving from DevOps to really full-scale collaboration, right? Sounds peachy and rosy, like, oh, wow, everyone's collaborating together. Like, it's amazing, right? Look, look at this, like, graphic, like, all the light bulbs are coming together. But, like, it's not all that, that peachy, right? Uh, one, uh, one alternative is collaborating, evolving customers. Uh, so this, this is an article on LinkedIn. You can look it up where they, uh, the CEO of Altada was talking about no ops, right? So operate, automating the operations, which is where a lot of companies are going today. And using customers, customer feedback directly into developers, right? So you, as a developer, you can go in and see if you're responsible for a specific part of the system. You can look at the customer feedback. You can look at like the MPS call, right? And make changes accordingly. Right, so that's uh, one approach we've seen uh, where the developers are tied closely with the customer experience, right? So that way, the developers own that experience, right? You don't have a business analyst or, or some other designer or product manager that is like heavily involved in, in these discussions because some of these discussions lead to nowhere. Like there's too many people involved, like everyone has their own ideas and own, own opinion. And there's no data driven approach. Like with this, like you've got the data and the developers own that experience. So they are constantly testing different versions or, or having different uh, outcomes. But that was, that's one approach uh, that we've seen uh, so far. But quite a different approach. Um, so there are some barriers to start collaborating, right? Uh, everyone would say, oh, yeah, this sounds great. Like I want to. Uh, work really well with uh, the other parts of the business, but how do I start? Right. Uh, one of the things you you want to take note of, like within your organization, is like uh, how many. This is a uh, by Jean Kim, right, in the Unicorn Project. Is like how many people you need to take out to lunch to to start collaborating or to start getting something done, right? Especially when it's outside your department, right? Everyone is really good at optimizing within their department. Like, oh, like, oh, we can do this. Whenever someone suggests something that is involving another department, they oh, you know, that's some other department. Let's not, let's not talk to them about that because like, we can't really do much about that. You no, know, maybe it could be APIs as well. You know, like that, the API team is sending us like incorrect data, but oh no, let's not talk to them. Let's, not, let's, not, let's write some code to change the data that they're sending to us. So that we can understand them or like work it, work, work it better. So there's always this this uh, barrier to collaborating, right? Because it's always within silos, right? Which is what DevOps actually solved. Like it broke down the silos between Dev and Ops. But now we actually have actually lots of other silos within the organization, and we start start to break them down. And it really comes down to the organizational culture, right? Uh, uh, where when you need people to start collaborating, you need people to be wanting to collaborate as well. Um, so if you need to speak to your manager and you need to speak to his manager's manager, and then you need to speak to the other department, and then they have to speak to another person, and it'll set up a call, but everything needs to be approved by your manager and manager's manager, uh, then it's probably gonna be very difficult to start collaborating, right? So the, my, my, <laughs> Uh, my version of the lunch factor is the Zoom factor. Like, how many Zoom calls do you need to start collaborating? Right? Or it could be uh, Cisco WebEx or Microsoft Teams or Google Hangouts. Right? But the, the, the concept is if you have to have multiple conversations, then, then it's just not 
possible to, to start collaborating. So you start working on that, that uh, the number of uh, Zoom calls or like so, so, so to see that uh, why, why it's so hard to collaborate, right? Especially within the uh, different departments, right? For me, if I need to speak to marketing, I can actually now just select someone in marketing, right? But in maybe in a previous organization, I had to speak to my manager and then he'd speak to the, the manager, like, that's in charge of the whole business unit. Yeah, it's, it can be quite complicated. So this is uh, one, one approach, uh, Dev360, where similar to what I showed you just now, DevX, uh, but this is one approach that we did for a, a retail customer that had retail stores, uh, as well as an online uh, portal, right? And they wanted people, especially more senior citizens to start um, especially above 60 or 70, start using the online uh, portal. And the UX wasn't that great. So the seniors were complaining, but they didn't know what to solve, right? So this way you can have things like Optimizely or, or different A-B testing tools to send uh, different versions of a website, right? And then you can collect feedback. I'm sure you've seen a lot of the, the MPS calls uh, feedback nowadays, right? Where how likely are you to recommend certain product to a friend? Like I think Tesla does it, a few other companies does that as well. And that's the net promoter score, right? It, it's trying to monitor, set, saying that the, the high mark watermark is recommending your product to a friend, right? And if not many people are, are willing to recommend, you want to know why, and then you work on that, those issues. So those feedback comes in. Right. And you can test out different versions. So if someone says like, hey, I don't like the website form, right? Uh the developers right can just send out a new version and test it with like maybe one thousand uh sessions, right? And you can get the feedback again, like, oh, okay, it's working now. Like, okay, like the feedback seems good. Let's push this out to everyone. All right. So that's A B testing or multi variable testing. And you can also have Google Analytics, Adobe Analytics to get you the cohort data, like you know what kind of demographics you're targeting and who's actually complaining about certain feedback. So you know that maybe there are different groups of users that are complaining about different things and they have different needs, right? So you can target them automatically. Uh, there are lots of session replay tools like Quantum Metric, Hotjar, Full Story, where you can actually see the interaction recorded in, in real time and replay that, that interaction on their website or, or mobile device right, or mobile app. And so with all these things, the new relic also integrates with all of these. And even with, with this situation where we, the customers at the store uh, will work with the staff staff to use the, the, the mobile website right, or, or the, the app. And the staff will be there to guide them and they'll also send feedback to us. right? So especially with Combank and like a lot of the banks in Australia where they're trying to shift a lot of the seniors that still go into the branch, right, to, to, to withdraw money and still do that. This kind of approach where they're constantly uh, making the user interface better and they're also guiding the, the, the users that come in, right, should have like, hey, look, it's easy to use, right, that constant feedback loop. And because the developers see the, the feedback come in, they are actually able to take action immediately, like they, whatever change they're making, they're getting the feedback, as opposed to having to have like multiple conversations with like a business analyst or some project manager, the customer service te team, you've got all these different stakeholders involved. And you know, previously, like just to make one change, it took four or five meetings. And then after that, the developers say like, oh, look, no, I've got to make 20 changes. So our next split would be, uh, October next month, you know, October 15, like, you know, we've got to test things out more properly. That, like, you know, fast adaptive enterprise, like, that's all gone, right? They are, they're constantly making changes. They're testing a bit here and there to see the feedback and, like, oh, are there any errors or issues? And obviously, New Relic is picking up all the performance and error issues. We also get able to co collaborate with the analytics tools or AB testing tools. To get all that data together and we have dashboards where you can see like how how the experience is like uh, for the end user 
and using that, developers are able to react much more faster, right? Um, to the changes and especially like you know when you have customer feedback as data, right? There's no one guessing. Like sometimes, if you don't have any data between conversations between uh, departments, like hey, I think this is a good idea. This is a, no, no, this is a good idea, but but there's never any conclusion, right? So what's the best way to test it, right? And then you can see the data and then no one can, can say anything about the data because it's from the customers, right? Uh, so having the customer as the center of the of that whole uh, organization really makes a big difference, right? especially when you're getting feedback and there's the feedback loop and you're constantly changing uh, the way uh, you interact with the customers. Yeah, so that's one aspect. And like, if there are any questions, like just ask me this uh, later on. Um, at the last session, quite a number of uh, uh, people had quite a number of questions about this. So yeah, we can we can have more questions uh, about this later on, right? Uh, so these are some of the effective outcomes. Like uh, we've worked with some of our customers uh, where they've got certain dashboards that they needed to track and based based on the like application performance or the conversion funnels, right? You know, how many people come to the website, sign up, or buy something, right? If you have like so many like if you look at this funnel, it's quite small, but there's so many people coming to the website but they're not registering and they're not buying something, right? Uh that's a very then you then you know where the problem is. Like people are not uh that's not enough incentive to register, for example, then at least the people in marketing or in on the website design can take action on those funnels that you have. It's, you have something similar in Google Analytics, but with New Relic, you are able to look at performance issues as well. Um, is it the end user that's having a connection issue or is there a problem with the form on the website that is causing? So it's a bit more detailed um, on that. And we can drill down to the exact uh, user IDs if necessary of what what's uh, causing issues. Yep. Uh, before I go on to Q and A, uh, my colleague uh, Stuart Xiao will be be doing a session tomorrow. Uh, so that time is in Perth time. So you've got to add in two hours for Sydney Melbourne time. Uh, so there's a session tomorrow about much more uh, detail about you know, observing what's probably your APIs. So obviously everything is all powered by APIs in the backend by two itself. Um, that's happening tomorrow at the workshop. And it also shows you how to bring in collaboration with the different teams uh, and, and, and pump data into New Relic as well. Right. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, that's all uh, I have. So we'll probably open up to a bit of Q and A and discussion. Cool. Thank you. That was um, yeah, that was interesting. And I guess yeah, pretty relevant in terms of um, current times where people are a bit more um, open to collaborative tools. Um, that was actually the first question um, that you mentioned: um, the Zoom and the lunches. Um, Zoom versus the lunches. I was going to say, would you say yeah. COVID has impacted this in in a positive way or a negative way in terms of people picking up these collaborative tools and more people using them? I would say definitely positive, uh, positively. Uh, but there is also an element that's sort of lost where people going to the office, you would naturally meet like a colleague from marketing at a at the you know, at the pantry or something and say, hey, you know, like that marketing campaign you run, like, you know, it's a bit off. But you, you would have that relationship with people from different departments. So mm -hmm. I think that's quite missing. So people need to hit a certain value before they actually reach out and Slack message someone because otherwise just focus on their day-to-day -day tasks. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and uh, another question was, uh, you mentioned a lot of the advantages of this new approach um, where we've got like a instant feedback between all the stakeholders. We've got like re reduced meetings, which is pretty yeah. appealing to me, um, and increased agility. Are there any disadvantages that you would foresee um, compared to the traditional DevOps approach? I think the probably disadvantage uh, 
maybe when you it's always when you get more people in uh to the into collaborating uh what and then there's a statistics and studies have shown that the number of ideas actually is low. Hmm. right so the, but there are, there are few quality ideas but the the quantity of ideas because someone always will, will shoot another idea down right so the quantity of ideas tends to drop when you get more people into the room and collaborating right so when it was just them and ops they could just like optimize and get things fast and get things going but yeah. more people start started coming in um yeah it's a bit of counterintuitive but yeah it's actually uh, studies have proven that the quantity of ideas starts to drop especially when you you're collaborating across geographies and job functions yeah. The more dynamics are involved, the more barriers that you're crossing over, the, the quantity of ideas start, start dropping. So that's one of the disadvantages uh, that you want to be aware of and like be, just be conscious of uh, when doing that kind of collaboration. Wow, OK. That's interesting. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't expected yeah. that. Um, and uh, another question just uh, are there any additional steps that you could recommend um like you mentioned the zoom meetings and lunches um yeah. for organizations who are interested in making this sort of shift are there any other like uh, little tips or helpful hints yeah. for getting started yeah i think first step is if you can't really change the, the line factor because it's maybe a birth of big bit just get a feedback form and like, find a way to get feedback from the customer because otherwise there'll be lots of business units or like different departments like have their own input and say, but once you have the customer feedback, then you get that, that ammunition to go to different departments and say, hey, look, no, this is not working. I right? know we've got to do something. And then you can bring them to the table and then start collaborating. So like have that feedback form in like some ways to get feedback in, into the platform yep. and use that feedback um, uh, continuously. And then you can set up things like A-B testing to test different versions. But getting that feedback form in and that loop from the customer, it's really, really important earlier on. Okay. Um, and that sort of that sort of leads on to the last question, which was just, um, is there any sort of, uh, from organizations who do implement this, any departments, is there any kind of pushback at first from people who are um, really set in the previous way of doing things? Um, any issues with just trying to get adoption for people who might be a bit freaked out to try something new? Yeah, I think there's always some sort of uh, pushback um, and some of uh, people getting freaked out. So I think getting that feedback form early in uh, mm. is a good, good way to start. And then say, hey, look, marketing or whatever department, we just want to review the feedback. Right? So, and then you, you show the feedback, every single feedback, you know, what's not working. and then people start wanting to solve because they realize like, hey, look, no, this problem affects me. It's about my department. I mm. got to be involved to solve it. Otherwise, like, you know, otherwise people would just say, yeah, yeah, I'll collaborate. But, you know, like they have their own priorities and they won't really want to collaborate with you. Once you make it also a joint effort and a joint problem, and then people start to get together and, and, and yeah. So it's about bringing people to the table as well. And you have to have a bit of skills to do that, right? And getting that feedback in really early and showing the feedback, raw feedback, like don't just mask it up. Like yeah. If it's some negative feedback, put it on the PowerPoint slide and say, look, these are the feedback we're getting in. We need to do something. Right? And that usually starts uh, people collaborating and people want to solve those problems. Yeah, I, I guess that'd be powerful yeah. because then people see that they are involved in terms of um, their feedback. Yeah. Cool. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very thank you. much. And um, yeah, cheers. <laughs> um.